Canada cut through mountains, tunneled beneath rivers and carved a path through frozen wilderness, all to move oil across 1,150 kilometers. It took years, $25 billion, and an army of engineers braving avalanches, resistance, and regulatory storms. But you know the real surprise? It wasn't just about oil. This mega project gave Canada something it had pursued for decades, strategic independence. It reshaped Canada's future and sent quiet ripples through its biggest energy partner. This is the story behind the Trans Mountain expansion and the unexpected ripple effects it might have for its biggest energy customer, the United States. Imagine producing nearly 5 million barrels of crude oil every day, yet having almost all of it, 97%, shipped to a single customer, the United States. That was Canada's reality in 2023, with over 3.8 million barrels per day exported directly south. On the surface, it looked like a healthy trade relationship, but underneath, it was an economic trap. Because Canada lacked direct access to global markets, its oil producers, companies like Suncor, Sovies, and Canadian Natural Resources, were forced to sell at steep discounts compared to world prices. At times, the price difference between Western Canadian Select and international benchmarks reached as high as $30 per barrel. That's billions in lost revenue every year. Revenue that never made it back to communities, services, or workers. The root of the problem was infrastructure. The original Trans Mountain Pipeline built in 1953 simply wasn't designed to handle today's production volumes, which had surged by over 40% in the past decade. Pipelines flowed mostly south, not west, and that one-direction trade really limited both profit and policy freedom. The need for change was, well, obvious. Canada had to diversify fast. It needed to reach new markets in Asia and Europe, where demand was growing and prices were higher. The solution? Expand the Trans Mountain Pipeline and unlock a western route to the Pacific. But, you know, laying steel through mountains, rivers, and frozen earth would be a challenge unlike anything before. Coming up next, the engineering marvel that made it possible. To break Canada's oil bottleneck, engineers had to do the unthinkable. Cut a high-volume energy corridor across mountains, wetlands, frozen plains, and densely populated coastlines. The route, a 1,150-kilometer 1 path from Edmonton, Alberta, home to the Athabasca oil sands, all the way to the West Ridge Marine Terminal in Burnaby, British Columbia, on the Pacific coast. This was the key to unlocking access to global markets. But building it would become one of the most complex infrastructure undertakings in Canadian history. The vision began in 2013, when Kinder Morgan proposed expanding the original 1953 Trans Mountain Pipeline. The idea seemed simple. Lay a second pipe, run it alongside the first, and triple the export capacity from 300,000 to 900,000 barrels a day. But what looked like a duplication turned out to be reinvention. Between 2014 and 2018, progress stalled. Environmental groups, indigenous communities, and legal opponents raised valid concerns about land rights and ecosystem protection. Permits were revoked and protests spread across construction sites as risk escalated. Eventually, Kinder Morgan pulled out. The project really appeared dead until the Canadian government stepped in, buying it for 4.5 billion Canadian dollars. Now it wasn't a business gamble anymore, it was a national infrastructure mission. Construction resumed in 2019, and what followed was a story of sheer resilience, broken down into four extraordinary phases. In Alberta, the pipeline had to cross wetlands and farmlands without tearing them apart. To do this, engineers used a technique called horizontal directional drilling, a method that allows pipelines to be installed deep underground without digging long trenches. It's kind of like threading a needle beneath the earth, guided by GPS and sensors, all while avoiding fragile ecosystems but the Rockies were the real monster. In British Columbia's Fraser Valley, construction crews faced landslides, unstable cliffs, and brutal winter storms. In one stretch, they advanced just meters per day, because each blast of rock had to be reinforced, mapped, and braced before the next could begin. Workers faced avalanches and sub-zero temperatures for months at a time. When slope failures hit in 2022 near Jacko Lake, construction paused for weeks. To fight nature, engineers deployed slope stabilization systems, which include steel anchors drilled deep into rock faces, reinforced walls, and erosion control measures designed to keep mountains from crumbling onto the pipeline. Westward toward the Pacific, the project shifted to twinning the existing 1953 line. 200 kilometers of dormant pipeline were reactivated, thoroughly inspected, and upgraded to modern standards. New pumping stations were added to maintain flow, 
and specialized welding crews worked around the clock to keep timelines on track. Finally, near Vancouver, the West Ridge Marine Terminal underwent a complete transformation. Engineers expanded it to include three deep water tanker berths, 19 high-capacity storage tanks, and state-of-the-art spill prevention systems. This terminal would become Canada's west-facing energy gateway, capable of serving markets in Asia, Europe, and beyond. By May 2024, the final welds were sealed. The pipeline flushed, pressure tested, and brought online. In an instant, Canada's oil export capacity tripled from 300,000 to 900,000 barrels per day. Overnight, every kilometer told a story of ingenuity, resistance, and human grit. From slicing through bedrock to tunneling under salmon-rich rivers, this wasn't just an engineering project. It was a race against geography, politics, and time. But now that oil could flow east, west, and across the Pacific, what would it mean for Canada's economy, and why is the United States paying such close attention? Coming up next, how one pipeline rebooted Canada's entire energy strategy. When the final weld cooled on, the Trans Mountain expansion, it marked more than the end of a mega project. It marked the beginning of Canada's energy transformation. For decades, Canadian crude flowed almost entirely in one direction, south. And with 97% of oil exports going to the United States, Canada's energy economy was deeply intertwined and honestly, dangerously dependent. This one-sided reliance came at a price. With limited access to global buyers, Canadian oil was routinely sold at a discount, costing producers like Suncor, Sonovas, and CNRL billions every year. The infrastructure didn't just cap oil flow, it capped potential. But, you know, with the TMX complete, that cap is gone. Canada's export capacity has now tripled from 300,000 to 890,000 barrels per day, creating a high-speed, high-volume highway straight to the Pacific. For the first time, Canadian crude can bypass congested U.S. pipelines and reach global markets directly. The impact was immediate. In 2023, Canada hit a historic high, exporting 4.8 million barrels of oil per day, a 3.4% rise from the year before. The value is an estimated $124 billion, representing 16% of the country's total exports. But it's not just about moving more oil. It's about what that oil unlocks. According to projections, TMX could inject up to 24 billion Canadian dollars into Canada's GDP every year. Over the next 20 years, oil producers are expected to earn 73 billion Canadian dollars in added revenues, with another 46 billion Canadian dollars flowing to federal and provincial governments through taxes and royalties. That money means infrastructure, healthcare, schools, and opportunity. And those opportunities aren't abstract. Nearly 38,000 jobs were created by the project. Over 3,600 were filled by indigenous workers. More than 6 billion Canadian dollars in contracts went directly to indigenous-owned businesses. For many communities, this wasn't just a pipeline. It was a pathway to partnership. But, you know, the most powerful shift is happening now as Canada begins selling to new buyers. Between May and November 2024, China alone purchased over 2 billion 300 million Canadian dollars in Canadian crude. Europe is following suit. Spain, the Netherlands, and other countries imported over 6.7 million metric tons in 2023. And in the energy-hungry economies of Asia, markets like India are emerging as the next frontier. With global demand rising, Canada now sits at a new kind of table, one where it's not begging for access but negotiating with options. And that's where the real value of TMX lies in energy sovereignty. This mega project didn't just reroute oil, it rerouted influence. Canada no longer has to wait on a neighbor's infrastructure or navigate a single trade lane. It's, you know, diversified, distributed, and for the first time in decades, really in control of its own energy destiny. But, you know, newfound independence brings new tension. Because if Canada starts looking outward, what happens to its most loyal buyer to the south? Coming up, how a single pipeline could flip decades of U.S.-Canada energy trade on its head. For over half a century, Canada's oil economy has operated on one unsaid assumption. The United States will always be the customer. Nearly every barrel of Canadian crude, 97% of it, has flowed across the southern border. It was predictable, comfortable, and, well, profitable for a time. But when you rely on one buyer, you don't control the terms. In 2025, that reality really came into focus when the U.S. administration floated the idea of a 10% tariff on Canadian energy imports. Just the suggestion shook investor confidence and honestly exposed a fragile truth. Canada wasn't just selling oil, it was doing so at someone else's mercy. For Canadian producers, the threat was massive. Billions in potential losses loomed. And, 
for the United States there was no easy backup plan. Many American refineries are built specifically to handle Canada's heavier crude. Swapping that out for lighter blends would require costly equipment overhauls, some estimated in the hundreds of millions per site and, yeah, years to implement. Two, this wasn't just economic interdependence, you know, it was mutual vulnerability. But while the United States talked tariffs, Canada quietly built an exit route. The Trans Mountain expansion wasn't just a pipeline, it was a pivot. By punching through the Rockies and connecting Alberta's oil fields to Pacific ports, Canada gave itself leverage it never had before. Now Canadian crude can sail west to Asia or loop east toward Europe. It no longer needs to funnel everything south and, well, that shift has really changed the game. This isn't about abandoning a trading partner. It's about no longer being boxed in by one. Canada now has the infrastructure to diversify its energy diplomacy, sidestep supply risks, and negotiate from a place of strength, not need. And yet, as Canadian tankers head off toward Shanghai, Rotterdam, and Mumbai, what's left for the refineries in Texas and Illinois? As new buyers emerge, Canada isn't turning its back. It's expanding its frontiers. But what happens when your most reliable supplier starts looking elsewhere? Is this the dawn of a more balanced trade era? Or the first move in a quiet energy rivalry between longtime partners? If this story gave you a new perspective on pipelines, power, and geopolitics, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you want more real-world engineering tales that reshape the map, subscribe to the channel. What mega project should we uncover next? Drop your ideas in the comments and thanks for watching from the bottom of our hearts.